Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our guest, our co-host. Happy Monday, Dr. Paul. How are you? Doing fine. Good. Ready and raring to go. Let's do it. We have to sort out a few things. Uh, yeah. You know, that Congress didn't sort that thing out with those hearings and no. checking out and find out uh, how you uh, control speech on a college campus. Seems like uh, I think the Congress and the legal system has actually invited those kind of problems yeah. rather than solving the problem. And writing another rule is not going to do it. But that's been big in the news. And I was very, very impressed with uh, the interrogation by, I guess, one single congresswoman uh, with the four presidents of the, co of the colleges. Uh -huh. And that, to me, was, was so impressive because, to me, it was so much uh, symbolism on uh, where our colleges are and have been. And I've talked a lot about colleges, uh, you know, not, not just uh, since these young people took charge, but uh, when it all started back in the beginning of the last century, yeah. uh, you know, in the progressive era, and I see this as a conclusion. Now, I, we have a long way to go to find out what happens, but, that, but I think this has done great uh, benefit by showing the ridiculousness of the government influence in our universities. Uh, to me, it was, uh, they had done more harm than I ever dreamed they could do, but I've never thought much of the system so this is what uh, this is what we end it. I have uh, f for years warned about it and believe that we can narrow this down to uh, the uh, age of uh, wokeism. Uh -huh. You know uh, that they, they don't like our system. They don't like our republic. They uh, they they don't like liberty, and they have to promote uh, you know a government pro uh, system which is mostly corporatism. And uh, but then they get into social management, and I think what we're hearing and seeing today about what's in the u university is is sort of the social management. Uh, what, what is what is the contact? What can you say? What is freedom of speech? And I think since they don't have a sound footing on these issues, it's it's a, it's a mixture of everything. What, good intentions, but uh, you know, just doing things that are making things worse. So. Uh, the uh, subject of the code of conduct came up and does that prevent you from saying something that would generate genocide? They got into all of this thing. But they follow, they have some rules though in, in, in dealing with this because uh, they've set up these rules in this last decade and uh, they, they have that, those two groups of rules. One is the ESG and the DEI and all this rules and regulations. And I, I think of the one that in, in recent history that they instituted, <coughs> <clears throat> they had concern. Uh, people were being taxed. Uh, the men were getting all the sports and the women get, didn't get any. Uh, so <clears throat> they had to become a formative action. We have to help the women. So there were mandates on there, which, uh, you know, uh, under some circumstances were reasonable. But all the mandates uh, led to what has happened now, that they were so eager about managing things. Uh, they were going to help women <laughs> get more sports. And, and look, the women have been kicked out. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an insult to the women and the way they manage that and let the, and making them compete against men. That doesn't make any sense. But, you know, the ESG, uh, you know, they, they have the authority and they want to regulate the environment, the social and the governance. And this is just all inclusive of what they think they should do. But their the university is not the only ones that have to follow these rules. Business people have to. Everybody's supposed to do it. And, you know, investments are based on are you following the rules? Yeah. And, and it's not the rules of the free market. It's the rules of um, ma mismanagement. But the DEI stuff is, is uh, also very very, uh, uh, you know, damaging because they, they tell you what you have to do and they have to be, when they hire somebody, they get a president or whatever, president of a university, uh, they, you, they have to be, um, you, you know, uh, 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 an understanding of what equity is all about, treat everybody equity, and you have to have a diversity, you have to have, you know, the mixture. When I look at this picture, I would say there's not a whole lot of diversity <laughs> there. <laughs> and then you have to be inclusive, diverse and inclusive, they get all mixed up with it. It is so, you know, radically different than a free market 
and a, govern, a, a school system which ex excludes government, government money and regulations, but you have a code of ethics and a code of rules that are set by the standard of the community. And lo and behold, if you check and compare the two, uh, you can find out that those schools that were free of government mismanagement did a lot better. They weren't in the news this weekend about what their position was on foreign policy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting week on <laughs> higher education, but you've talked about it for years. We've talked about it for a long time, the decline of speech on campus uh, and with the codes, with the, um, uh, with the regulation of speech to one side or the other. Let's look at um, this first clip. <clears throat> this is essentially what we're talking about now. This was on Hedge. Plenty of stories out there about this, uh, but this was on Thursday. Jews genocide and how the universities were lost. Uh, he says, for decades, our elite institutions and media have treated free speech as increasingly dangerous. As Alex Berenson highlights in an excellent summary, they have used their power to put topics off limits, especially those that expose racial differences. Like most evils, censorship metastatizes. Universities now police even the smallest offenses against minority or self-declared marginalized groups. Now go to the next one. This has that picture that you like, Dr. Paul, of those uh, university presidents, of I I Ivy League university presidents there being grilled, <coughs> excuse me, before Congress. Um, uh, and the article goes on talking about the rot that's out there on campus. Last year, Harvard declared misgendering, that is referring to transgender people by the pronoun of their actual birth gender, as a form of abuse. The year before Columbia, had declared it a fireable defense, a fireable offense. Uh, this attitude, this context, to use a word heard frequently in Tuesday, which is last Tuesday when the hearing took place, is what makes Tuesday's congressional testimony by three presidents of elite American universities so shameful, fraught, and hypocritical. So this is a cultural rot. This is a rot that's been going on a long time. And to a degree, it was exposed on the, in the hearings last week. But the real question is, what were the motives behind the exposition of this? Uh, is there any hypocrisy involved? And what's the way out, I think? Yes, Ian, you know, they uh, asked the question about who, who should regulate this? Because they're talking about speech. What yeah. can you say and what you can't say? And I, I think they have an impossible task. Uh, and I've often said this uh, uh, you know, and I was even thinking about grade school and high school when they might have dressing codes. Yeah. Who does it? You, you wouldn't have it. You want to protect civil liberties. At the same time, you, you don't want to uh, have people not acting civilized. Yeah. So you have to have some rules. And I, I struggled with that. And the only thing I could come up with is the, the entity that's uh, closest to the management. If, if, if we have the government, it's the local community, yeah. but not the UN or the, or, or the federal government or the state government even, and that would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the way to handle this. But uh, it, the, right now, if, if you're going to uh, control speech, you have to ask uh, what speech is to be controlled and, and how do you do it? And I, I don't think it's possible to take all these universities and have a code of conduct. They yeah. might just want to tinker with that, you yeah. know. And, and I think what we're witnessing now is this tinkering around and government involvement and uh, philosophers' involvement for all these years. And you would think of the deterioration since 1913. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the universities have been the instigators of all this. But I, I think what, what is happening right now is a conclusion <laughs> of this effort because I, I, I make the analogy frequently to economics because in economics they've been tinkering since the progressive era and we still have a monster system and people are just waiting for it to collapse. Yeah. And in a way this is a, a social thing. They're, they're waiting for this, uh, this to collapse and it, it will. But it's, it's uh, <clears throat> to me, people don't understand the First Amendment. People don't have, uh, people have really rights of free speech if you, if you own your property. Yeah. If, you, if, it's, if it's somebody's church or somebody's home, you're not going to have a government agent at the door. They might try to, especially if you're broadcasting or something. They yeah. want to invade and take care of it. 
but they want to come in and regulate that. But most people understand, no, we don't want the government doing this, and we, we don't want the, uh, the government, uh, you, you know, uh, t t taking control of the speech in the First Amendment. But the whole thing is, is that's what they, that's what they think they should do. But I think what we should do is just, you know, wean ourselves off this absolute dependency on, on the government. And I think we're, whoever puts the money in has a say-so. You know, and it's the taxpayers, it's the politicians, and then they come up with all this uh, wokeism. Yeah. And it's just their tool. I mean, that's an army set up of people who believe in wokeism. And wokeism is not a nice system. Yeah. I think it is contrary to the principles of liberty. I think it's got a contrast to common sense. And it's uh, the last thing that we need. And yet they're riding a high horse right now and they're, they're doing well. But the reason I think this, this picture, especially that we looked at, I think it's so interesting because they're, uh, they're, they're, they have some sour faces there. Yeah. And they good. And that system should get some sour faces, too, because, you know, I've had some, my kids go to state universities and all. And I remember one of them coming out of me and says, Dad, my teacher that teaches me economics is a, is a declared communist. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you handle that? It, w w when, you, when it's government, it's harder to do it. Yeah. But if it was in our private school or my home schooling group, I'll tell you what, we have the right and the obligation to regulate it, and we regulate speech through voluntarism and through property rights. Yeah, that would be the way. But you know, this this uh, hearing did expose, um, you know, the wokeism that r that runs campus. But you know, a lot of people, people that we look up to as free speech absolutists, uh, Glenn Greenwald comes to mind. Um, they talk a lot about the hypocrisy, um, because a lot of what you've seen on these campuses has been post October seventh when Israel has uh, started attacking the Palestinians. And the first thing you saw on a lot of campuses was some serious, serious demonstrations uh, against the attacks, the Israeli attacks, and against um, and in favor of Palestinians. And that's what kind of started this whole thing, because you saw it on Harvard, very, very big on Harvard. Uh, and you saw massive protests, and you didn't, you know, they weren't protests to kill uh, the Israelis. They were protests for Palestine. But there's been a lot of people like Greenwald would say there's been a hypocrisy among people who were against wokeism because their response to the rise of the protesters on these university campuses has been to demand that they actually restrict more speech or to add <laughs> criticism of Israel into the basket of things you can't criticize. Transgender, um, gays, uh, uh, you know, blacks, what have you, and put that in there. So... Um, I have a couple of things from Greenwald. I think he's made some good points going against the grain, as he always does, because there was an op-ed in the Washington Post, to fight anti-Semitism on campus, we must restrict speech, was the name of the article. Now, anyone who knows Glenn Greenwald would know that that is like kryptonite in front of him. He says, I genuinely appreciate candor in political discourse. What people say and what they really want and mean, like below. When people say what they really want and mean, like below, it is clarifying. The key argument is that there's too much free speech on campus and censorship is needed to curb bigotry and anti-Semitism. And if you'll just do one more, this is what he means when he says this, because he highlights part of the article. He says, the cause of censorship and destroying free speech in the U.S has had one of its greatest moments over the past two weeks. The attempt to claim that there is an anti-Semitism crisis in the U.S. and that only censorship can fix it has been cheered on by many. And here's their core argument. And he highlights a couple of things from that op-ed. Universities must consider their obligations to broader society as they prepare young people to assume responsibilities. Privileging free speech on campus relative to other values emphasizes skills that pose the greatest challenge to our democracy and fails to cultivate skills democratic societies most need. And the third one he highlights, isn't it time for university presidents to rethink the role that open expression and academic freedom play in the educational mission of their institutions? Three strong arguments saying we have got to restrict speech on campus. So their answer to wokeism is actually reverse right-wing wokeism. 
Yeah, you know, the, uh, th th this works to a degree, but when <clears throat> the problem is if you have some people speaking out, but if you don't have the government out, just, and I think of the dilemma we had with, uh, with COVID. Yeah. You know, we're, we're speaking out and others spoke out and they were punished because it was the government that, that was involved. Yeah. And that's, that's where the problem comes. Once they do, now what can, what can they do? Actually, uh, it wasn't the academicians that helped us out on there. No. It was the parents that saw it's an attack on raising their children and they started to demonstrate and st stand up for it. That's right the right to speak out and speak your piece and to demonstrate if there's no violence yeah. that it should that's it should they should concentrate they on that but all of a sudden you know once violence occurs then it's back and forth and back and forth so somebody broke the rules and i uh, there are times when both sides are guilty, but both times we might be supporting both sides. Yeah. That's that's a big problem because we are, we have an empire. It's sort of like the, our kids and our empire are in internally fighting each other, yeah. and we have to pick it. It makes it tough, you know. Yeah. How can we give money to each side? Yeah. Well, we do it, and it why? Well, that's no problem. We can make money rebuilding those societies yeah. we you know tear up. The money's endless. Yeah. <laughs> Well, to finish up on this one, I think, and we'll keep an eye on it, but do that. Skip over to the very last Greenwald. He has a lot of great stuff on this, and he's always, I, I, he's just <coughs> always on, you know, absolutely on point. And here's his last one, and he puts up another uh, op-ed in the <coughs> Washington Post that he recommends people read. Uh, the, uh, the title of the op-ed is College Presidents Reveal Three Surprise Truths About Free Speech and Anti-Semitism. And he summarizes them. Number one, university presidents have been imposing campus censorship. And that's what you started out by saying, Dr. Paul. And But number two, much of what is now being called genocide advocacy on Israel is clearly within First Amendment speech. Greenwald points out from the article. And three, and I think we would all agree on this, Dr. Paul, you and I and Glenn and many others, the only solution is to oppose all censorship. Yes, well, the fight's going to go on. I <clears throat> also try to emphasize the fact that I do believe that over this past hundred years, uh, systematically and steadily, there's been a coup of the original system. And, and that means we don't have a republic and we have undermined those principles. And we were warned that would happen if you don't have a moral people. You know, if you have two people that uh, disagree strongly with, with ideas, but if they want to talk and discuss it, it, it's it's just different. It's sort of you, you you know what are the moral standards, and I think we've lost on that, and uh, I think we're seeing what happens uh, you know with a system where literally the <clears throat> the republic has been dissipated. It's it's gone, and you don't have the emphasis on an understanding of the First Amendment, yeah. and then they're always looking for who's going to get the best uh, advantage, and usually money is involved in power, and that's uh, that's uh, our fault. But I still think there are people waking up. I think this should be a wake-up call, just like you know, the people sent a wake-up call about COVID. Yeah. And they're, I, I'm hoping that they never are allowed to march over us with these vaccines again. Yeah. But they're trying and they're persisting it. So that means we should be vigilant. Yeah, vigilant. That's all we can do. Well, the last one is more of an update, but it's actually kind of news, which is tomorrow. Believe it or not, Dr. Pond, this is going to shock you. <clears throat> Guess who's back in town? Not Santa Claus coming to town. No, Zelensky. It's the op. It's a reverse Santa Claus, right? Instead of giving you stuff, he takes stuff. So believe it or not, now we've been talking about this on the show for a while, that the Biden administration is getting desperate. Last week, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, Tucker Carlson tweeted out that a source of his in Congress told him that in a closed door meeting, Secretary of Defense Austin told members of Congress, if you don't vote this money for us, we're going to send your kids and your family and your nephews out to fight in this war. A real threat. And Biden has been essentially saying the same thing. He said, if we, if Ukraine doesn't win, American troops will be fighting Russia in Europe. And they've been also talking about the domino theory. Putin, when he finishes with Ukraine, is going to take over Berlin. He's going to take over London, Amsterdam. He's going to town. He's going to be over here soon. They've been going full court press try to get this money. We've also talked about how Republicans have been so um, uh, 
what's the word for it, hypocritical about it. They're not against the funding, but hey, we need a little something. Grease the wheels for us. We need a little bit of money for the border. You know, um, <clears throat> the saddest thing that I come across looking at all this and seeing this activity is that so much harm and killing and waste and suffering and starvation all could be prevented. You know, it's not like <clears throat> we don't know what does it, but there's so much greed in the country where people want to make money on this and they go along with this. And uh, it, it, to me, uh, <clears throat> is such a tragedy. One, one tragedy I see that I really am annoyed by <clears throat> is when I see the uh, handicapped veterans coming back. Oh, yeah. You know, and I think, you know, they're making it. They're heroic in, in them not giving up. But it's so criminal because how about the people that died, the civilians that died, yeah. the uh, people who are suffering now without their limbs or blinded and so like. And I thought it could have all been prevented. Yeah. This, this was not, this just didn't fall out of the sky. We created, people created this monster. And even the, <clears throat> the many friends we have, they have disagreements with us of saying, you're right, generally speaking, but yeah. on certain occasions, you gotta bend the rules, you gotta be yeah. more pragmatic, you yeah. know, you can't do that. And they don't do it. They think uh, non-intervention and uh, allowing people to make up their own mind, there's some shortcomings. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, these, uh, these codes that they wanna write have a lot of shortcomings. But the codes that individuals write for themselves uh, will have a few shortcomings, but it's far better for individuals to write their own codes of conduct and people living in a voluntary society and getting their education from private institutions than to think that they can go and, oh, well, I'm going to run for Congress and I'm going to change all this. Yeah. You know, they have to be a little more realistic. Yeah. Well, here's a bad sign uh, because <clears throat> Zelensky will be here tomorrow. He's going to go see Biden, talk a little bit with Biden. But he was invited here by Schumer and McConnell. Now, McConnell last week, and you could tell he's very deceitful. Last week he said, there's going to be no money for Ukraine. I'm not going to vote for any money for Ukraine without the border. Lindsey Graham said the same thing. The two biggest champions of Ukraine money were pretending that they were against it. Uh, but the bad sign is that Mike Johnson, the speaker, is going to have a private meeting with Zelensky. He's not going to be telling him no money. He's going to be telling him, how can I sell this? You know, the whole reason they got rid of McCarthy is because McCarthy wouldn't take the money for Ukraine out of the CR, number one. And number two, the main one, according to Gates, you know, who led the, res uh, the revolt, was that McCarthy was willing to work with Dems to pass the money for Ukraine. And it looks like Mike Johnson is simply a younger version of Kevin McCarthy on this. So... I think it's a big deal. This money is a big deal. All the mainstream outlets in the U.S. and Europe are saying Ukraine has no chance of winning, zero chance. Even the ones that were champions of the war, developed, we talked about it last week, no chance of winning. Biden has not come to Congress and said, here's how Ukraine can win. Here's how the $60 billion will, will result in a victory. It's good money spent. None of that will happen. The only thing they can say is it's a jobs program. And Putin is coming to town if we don't do it. So, I mean, uh, we don't often tell people to call their congressman. But if I would say, Dr. Paul, I mean, just for me, if your congressman doesn't know that you're opposed to sending another $60 billion to Ukraine, he or she needs to know in a polite note why you think it's a bad idea to vote for it. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> most everything is a consequence of ideas and philosophy and uh, the acceptance of this to some degree. But uh, w what we see here today and the people you were talking about and the people I knew in Congress, uh, they were all <laughs> educated in this system. Maybe not the fanciest universities, but the atmosphere has been similar, you know, and it's just a few. There's a handful, but there are some good universities that try to buck this, and there's some good homeschooling programs that try to buck this, but uh, that, that's, that doesn't do the whole thing. But this is a reflection. The people that he's dealing with, you think, well, they said this, but I needed that in order to do get in a position and, and really help change things for the better. No, I can't do everything. But if I could just get in office, I could move the needle a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, if, if you didn't notice, I didn't accept that philosophy at all. No, yeah, so, at all. No, and it, it didn't work. Matter of fact, uh, I came to the conclusion that 
you know, as far as uh, influencing people, you know, the softer approach and being principled on it gains more favor than to, oh, he's just, you know, he's just another one of those, yeah. you know, but, you know, a guy like Gates, he's controversial. But one thing is, is so far, you know, he's, he's pretty steady and he's, that works hard to try to be a uh, stick to what he has uh, preached. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, I'm all done, Dr. Paul. I, the last thing I would say on this Monday is thanks for watching the program. It's Christmas season. I know you're out there doing your shopping, but we appreciate you giving us a half hour of your day. Very good. And I, too, want to thank our viewers for t tuning in. And uh, there's a lot of excitement going on, and it will it'll continue. They will not solve the uh, problem in the universities. That's a big one, but I think there's cracks in the wall, and people are questioning the validity of the system of education that we've been put up. Uh, putting up with, and I, th I think that's good. But the foreign policy is uh, tremendous uh, uh, to uh, solve that problem. And, and uh, Daniel points out very well that people are going to pursue it, and Zelensky's here. It's just too bad if they cave and start giving that money. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid they will because they have so many ways of doing this and punishing the people who won't go along. And that, that's what happens. So uh, they, they will probably find some way. And it might be, like I mentioned the other day, they might do it in a secretive way. Who knows what, what they'll do. But, uh, but the frustration is not just with a few of us in this country who are sick and tired of it, but it's creeping around. And there's some Europeans that uh, are getting a little annoyed with it. But there's also stories out that, you know, Europeans, you know, you're the ones that are best, uh, uh, most vulnerable. You know, Russia's coming to get you. You know, it'll be scaremongering there, <clears throat> and then there'll be more pressure put on it. So we want to uh, thank everybody once again uh, for helping us along, and uh, hope you return to the Liberty Report soon. <laughs>